are live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Show Must Go On Line. Today's guest is Bill Sherman. Bill, how are you doing today? Fantastic. Another day of uh, enjoyment of, uh, you know, COVID staying inside. It's fantastic. Yes, staying inside, <laughs> enjoying this newfound lifestyle that we are all taking part in. Have you Absolutely. have you found like a, a new routine that's kind of worked for you? I mean... Uh, yeah, sometimes. So I live in Westchester and my girlfriend lives in New Jersey. So I sort of hop back between the two of them. My kids yeah. go back and forth and stuff. And so uh, so I've been like, you know, trying to figure out how to make a home in both places and yeah. just trying to like stay active and not sit around all day. That being said, I have been watching a lot of television, particularly shows that I've seen before <laughs> so that I can like have them on in the background while I do other things. And then yeah. Yeah, I have like a whole setup of like keyboards and mobile things just so I can work and do stuff. So um, yeah, it's a lot of that. It's a lot of uh, just trying to stay busy and not completely bore myself to death. Right, right. And I could imagine trying to do your work all through like these type of virtual meetings is like an interesting difference in like being able to play a note and have someone right here that maybe is like, wait, what if you do this? And then they take over the keys. Like, do you have any of those type of situations? Well, I will say my favorite sort of um, technological breakthrough we've been able to have for this is the Sesame Street. So I work for Sesame Street. I've been the music director forever for 10 yeah. years. That's not forever, for 10 years. And a uh, long we time. We we uh we always record at a studio in in Brooklyn. Uh, it's called Studio G. It's in Brooklyn, and we go there almost every Tuesday throughout the year to record. And right now we can't. And so what we've been able to do is to set up everybody in the band with a remote uh, studio. So uh, we will work on stuff. We will the some someone will write the music, and then we'll send it to the drummer first, and then he'll send it to the bass player. And so we've been able to remotely record Sesame Street, which is a pretty major achievement. And uh, something I didn't think would happen. So I was wondering how that part of my job was going to work. But here we are. And it seems to work. And people seem to be into it. And I doubt anyone could hear the difference except for probably me. So there you go. Right. Yeah, I, I agree that there is this fun new aspect of like when you're forced into a different situation, you see how that will work. And then it's like, wait, maybe we could do this in the future if we have to, if there's someone who's coming from out of town. like. Now, I think as a society, we're kind of more okay with this, even when we're fortunate enough to be in the same room and it's safe and healthy, like there's gonna be this new mindset of like, well, maybe we do a type of like Zoom or StreamYard interview or guests on, you know, Sesame Street. Absolutely, it feels like everybody who I talk to just keeps on saying, you know, things are gonna change, things are going to change. And you sort of have to start to believe that and then, yeah. and then, and then figure out how you're gonna change with it or not, I mean, you know, I still, you know, I still work in television and, and yeah. movies and television, you have to get near each other and you have to be close to each other. But what does that mean? And so what are sets going to be like and what are studios going to be like? And, I, you know, I'm, I'm interested to see how that all comes out. I sort of just I play every every different thing I work on. I just figure out how to play that particular thing and try mm -hmm. not to relate it to a to a like a, a greater whole, like as if this is how it's going to be all the time. So, so that so far has worked. Although, you know, Sesame Street is still producing things. We're working on uh, stuff remotely. We do a lot of stuff. Uh, the, the puppeteers record at home. Uh, we're going to a f farm or something next week to shoot outside. So it's, you know, it's everybody's wow. sort of, everybody's just sort of trying to figure out how it gets done. And like movies, I think movies just opened up uh, mm -hmm. in New York and so, I think one movie I'm working on is just shooting two person scenes until like early next year when they can do bigger scenes for bigger things. So everybody's just sort of trying to figure it out and it's very weird. And uh, I, I was talking to a friend the other day who was remotely recording an orchestra. Like he was at home, there was an engineer at a big studio and then there was all these orchestra people all separated by plastic, like big pieces of plastic. Wow. Which I thought seemed like something weird and from the future, but that's, yeah, that's what people are doing. Just trying to make it work. So it's that. Yeah. Or it's that or sit at home and watch some more, you know, West Wing. <laughs> but is that such a bad thing? I mean, for the record, uh, my girlfriend has never seen West Wing before, which I guess is a crime in most states. What? And so she, and so last night I said, why don't we start this? And I was like, I don't know if she's going to like it, but we went, we got two episodes in before it got late. And she was like, I really like it. And I was like, great. So this will be like my 15th time watching the West Wing. And I'm still kind of into it. Like, it's also like, I'm like, it's, that show is so great that it also, it surprises me every time anyway, so. Totally. What the heck? I, 
I feel that. Yeah, you can never go wrong with West Wing. I did rewatch last year. It's a it's an interesting show because I like watched it with my family kind of growing up and then now watching it on my own. It's like, oh yeah, like this is also a show that I just enjoy as like a human and not just as like the family sit down. <laughs> Absolutely. My parents used to preach about it when I was a kid when like and and yeah. and I was like, oh, it's just a show for old people, and I wouldn't like it, and da da da. And then years later, it's like that's all I, you know, I watched it like fifteen times. So right, exactly. They were right. So I see, I see all of y'all commenting. Hello, friends. Ashley, <laughs> Lisa, Eva. I see Miranda. Oh, wow. All of your your comments. Um, please keep them coming. I love it. We will get to questions kind of later on. And so we spoke about a little bit of Sesame Street, but you have had quite the long career and are a, a nice Tony, Emmy, and Grammy Award winner, which is a fun, fun trio to be able to. Yeah. <laughs> I remember on the FLS doc, we are Freestyle Love Supreme, 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 Supreme. Mm -hmm. They were like, oh yeah, like so many people here have awards. Like we don't really talk about it except for JMI, if we don't talk about his Tony, then right. is it really is it really FLS? So what's it like to be with a group where like everyone kind of has these like impressive no like notches and so mm. then they almost like cancel each other out, but it's like a fun thing. I think that's exactly the right analysis. It's so weird, like we never, we never talk about them. We only talk about them to make fun of each other to other people. So like, it's just like this very strange and bizarre assumption that like half the guys in that group have Tonys and Grammys and Emmys, which is like, that's ridiculous, you know? And, uh, and, and yeah, and we don't, we only talk about it to mess with each other. And, and, uh, and, and when James won, and then like for a while there was like a jealousy because like <clears throat> Lynn and I had a bunch of them and the other guys didn't and then some other guys won some. And then that year that, that David won and then J James won one and then Utkarsh is really jealous because he doesn't have any and like that was the whole thing and like it was you know and it's it's such a like where in life you know if we were a competitive sports team we would all like start to kill each other but we're like a non-competitive rap group so like there's <laughs> there's like no competition other than like brotherly like we're all kind of successful and having a good time and we get to do this for a living so like it's fine, you know, yeah. but, um, but yes, it's, it's very surreal and I don't understand it. And I as well take it for granted. It's just sort of been a part of my life that I, I don't know, that I didn't expect to have, but uh, it, it's great. And, yeah. uh, and my kids like the awards. They, they, uh, their friends came over the other day and wanted to take selfies with them, which I thought was very funny. And yeah. so, so yeah, so there you go. Oh, that's amazing. I love how I love how much you talk about your kids and how they're kind of like the the earworms for if a song is good. Yeah. They still are to this day. They will they are well that being said, my my old my older daughter Maya is fully into TikTok, like all day, all yeah. night TikTok dances and they, they're out they're like I don't know if you know about this, but like TikTok dances when the kids do them, they have like this dead face and they do all these hand motions with like a totally dead face. And so it's very creepy because your kid's like a dancing zombie. Anyway, so um, so so she yeah, so she knows all the music. So when we were in the car, she turns on, she grabs my phone, she DJs. She's nine. She DJs and she plays all this stuff that like, I was like, this is terror. It's like all trap music for the most part and like all this dance stuff and it's great. But then we go home and I'll I'll write a song and I'll have her come downstairs to my studio and I'll play it for her and she'll be like, okay. And if she says, okay, then that's like, throw it in the garbage. And if she's like, she's like, oh, okay, I like it. And then the, the, the best test of all is like, if like an hour later we're eating dinner and she starts to sing it, then like, then I know that it's pretty good. Then I succeeded, you know? So yeah. I try to, I try to do as much as possible. So. That's a good, that's a good test to have. Does she listen like nowadays to any of the work that you've kind of done throughout the years? Absolutely. So the, uh, her mother, both of them, their mother uh, played In the Heights for them uh, on repeat a bunch. And they were very excited about the movie coming out. Yeah. And they are also big Hamilton fans. They have they, they know all the Hamilton. And uh, uh, they were Sesame Street fans for like a minute. In fact, the funny story about Sesame Street is two things. One is I brought them to the to the set of Sesame Street. Yeah. And initially, they're like amazed and in awe and wonder. And then they get a couple years older and they're kind of just like, can I play with my iPad on the one, two, three steps? And you're just like, that's not okay. You know, that's, yeah, come on, kid. And then, and then, uh, um, 
they were on Sesame Street. Uh, they were like background players on an episode. Oh. And true to their form, they were told to like throw a ball back and forth behind the scene that was happening. So it's hilarious because they throw the ball back and forth and then they start like yelling at each other or like bickering with each other. And then there's another part where like they, one of them just looks directly at the camera. Anyway, it was like a total disaster, but like very, very funny. Um, but yeah, they're, they kind of aged out of it at this point, but they like think it's kind of cool. Like they will sometimes brag to their friends about what I do, which is kind of silly because they just think it's cool, but you know, they yeah. don't know. That's much better than what you normally hear, which is like, oh yeah, daddy or mommy, it like does this musical thing or like this TV show thing, but like, who cares? What's for dinner? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, they're they're engaged to a point and then they're just like, it's just what he does. Like, it's not that yeah. big of a deal, which is, which is hilarious also. So, you know, and they're, yeah. you know, and my, my, my ex-wife and I talk about all the time that we're just used to, they have a, a life that they're used to wherein you know everybody who's on the Broadway stage and you go backstage at everything you go to and you meet every famous person you can possibly meet because that's your life and that's how it is. Whereas like my life wasn't like that whatsoever. And so like right. they just they just assume that like if we're going to see somebody, whoever it is, we're going to meet them and be their best friend and like go out to dinner with them and a whole thing. And it's all crap, but at least that's what they think. And like the fact that they're used to that is just very, I mean, we're very lucky that that's the case, but it's, you know, it's ridiculous, so. yeah. Yeah, you just assume that it happened. <laughs> exactly. I I will try to hold back, but there will be many a Hamilton and <laughs> In the Heights and and Juliet references like sprinkled throughout. So like, feel just free. Wait. Feel free. I'm totally into it. You know, I woke up singing some Hamilton something the other day because I think the the movie really like got me going and excited about it again. And it was great yeah. and I loved it and I forgot how great it is. And uh, yeah, and so my kids are really into it. So it's exciting. So. Oh, nice. So I feel like we jumped right in, but I always love to hear about like, what's your origin story? <laughs> uh, I grew up on Long Island. Uh, I played the saxophone. I was really into jazz music. I had really these two amazing teachers in high school who like taught me how to play music. And then I went to Wesleyan University. This is more than an origin story. This is my whole story. But anyway, uh, I went to I went to Wesleyan University. I played the saxophone. I met Lynn my sophomore year of middle Lynn and Will Miranda. He of the the fame. He and I have been like very close since we were about nineteen. Uh, he. But his uh, mind is older. His mind, well played, uh, very much so. Also, uh, he's all he's almost a, a total year older than me, which is interesting. Um, his birthday is in January and mine's in November, but they're a year apart, like a oh, year and two months. Yeah. And he has, fun fact, his dad and my dad, or my dad and he have the same birthday, which is fun. January um, 16th. That's right. Uh, which I, good. which I, I like that you know that. Quick note, it's not sketchy. My birthday is January 14th and I saw oh, okay. him perform on his birthday in Puerto Rico. Oh, there you go. So yeah. yes, Lynn, uh, January 16th. Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, anyway, so we met and uh, he, he, we've been working together ever kind of since then. We we lived, we were roommates for like five years, six years, and then like we both got married and had kids kind of at the same time. We worked on In the Heights and uh, and then we worked on The Electric Company and blah, blah, blah. I think my, my origin story, which is a story that I tell all the time about how I kind of got into theater and how Lynn and I met, was he came up to me. Oh, I was music directing once on this island, which his girlfriend was producing. and. Uh, and uh, he came up to me, at, he had came to see it, he came up to me afterwards and he said, I don't know you and you don't know me, but we're gonna work together for a really long time. And I said, that sounds fantastic. And so like, that was, that's, if that's the story, that's probably the story. And then, you know, I didn't know it at the time, but like my life surely changed from then on. And so, uh, so I was never into musicals. I saw my parents, so I lived on Long Island and my parents used to take us to see, like I saw the original cast of Rent, but like at that time I didn't know what I was seeing. I was just like, cool, it's music, like I didn't know. And then, uh, I worked on I worked on Lynn's shows in college, and then we worked on In the Heights, and then I, you know, I finally like could wrap my head around it, and then, um, yeah, and then here we are, you know, some twenty years later, exactly twenty years later. Wow, <laughs> that wow. makes me feel super that, old. It, right. <laughs> it is so fun to hear like your story and like Arthur, the geniuses, how like knowing Lynn before everyone knew Lynn and mm -hmm. like that that part in the We Are Freestyle Love Supreme documentary where Tommy Kale like turns to Lynn and he's like there's a good chance nobody will ever know who we are like ha, mm -hmm. ha, 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 ha. yeah 
well, hilarious now. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, I, the story that I always tell about Lynn, like, you know, we were like inseparable for between the ages of like 19 and like 26 until I got married or got, you know, I moved out. We lived together from like 22 to 26, I think, ages wow. 22 to 26. Yeah. And in like this, this terrible apartment in Inwood where like if it rained outside, it rained inside. No. And, we would, and we would like, he was a substitute teacher and I worked at, uh, at MTV in like the IT department because my dad got me a job, right? So like we have, we were such losers and we would like, we would like skateboard in the house and the house was disgusting and like no one kind of wanted to be there. It was great. It was great. It was the greatest place to live. And the rent was like $500 each or something ridiculous, right? I know. With like what? in, just sounds crazy. Um, but it was an Inwood, it was the top floor, it was, the elevator sometimes broke, it was six floors up. Anyway, uh, but there was like a great pizza place and Lynn's parents lived around the corner. So when we would like, when The Sopranos was still in like airing its original episodes, we would go to their house for dinner on Sundays, which was like a big deal because it was, we never ate well, like we ate like pizza bagels all the time. And so like, it was good to have like some real food. So we went there and we watched The Sopranos every Sunday, so great. Um, but uh, I don't know what the point of that story was. So, so yeah, story. yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. And Lynn, but the thing about Lynn is, I think, was just fascinating. It's even when we were that age, like 20, 21, 22, like he wouldn't outwardly say it, but like he knew that he was going to be this person. He just knew it. And at what? And it, at that time, and still to this day, like it didn't come off as like cocky or arrogant. It was just like genuine and honest. And you're kind of like. It, like generally you're like who the hell are you like how do you possibly think that and you're so confident about it and i was just like all right cool like i like to work on your shows like we have a good time together like let's do it and yeah. so like then that and that's it like but that's he he's still you know i was just like i just remember him saying that he's like oh yeah i'm gonna this is gonna be a thing and i was like oh okay who are you you know and hey he was right so what do i know <laughs> i I love that. And it is, you know, I think there's so much as like a society that we're like, stay humble and don't whatever. But like, if you have a big dream and you know that like you're good enough and you're putting in the work, I think there's something kind of cool about being able to like share that with your friends and be like, no, this is going to happen. Like I, I always say like, I've covered the Tony Awards for another company, but like I'm going to cover the Tony Awards for B-Way Show. And it's more putting it into the universe, like putting it into existence. And I I almost hear that sort of thing on a different level. Yeah, it's a little bit like that, but I'm all for humble too. And and so is he. And so like it was it was, a, it was an interesting thing when he said it. And yeah. so and so uh yeah, and you know, speaking of 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 humble things and stuff like that, it's one of my favorite things about uh uh, freestyle of Supreme, like everybody in that group is humble to one extent or another. And there's all of this fame and all of this celebrity and all of this whatever, but we're all just kind of like these dudes that like hanging around. And I've said this before in interviews, which is just like, I, I think a lot of us, I personally, I don't say a lot of us, I do that gig because I get to hang out with my friends. And like, yeah. because they're like famous, they're famous folk, like you don't really get to hang out with them. And so, mm -hmm. so if you, if we do gigs like that, like this last, you know, this past Christmas, when I saw you, this, whatever that was, uh, yeah. you know, doing that whole run on Broadway was just so fun because we just got to hang out, you know? Yeah. And so, and so it was like bringing, you know, it was recalling those days when we actually used to have time to hang out with each other because we didn't have schedules and all this craziness. So mm. yeah, there you go. That's so true. And you can tell, like, that's part of the reason why we kept coming back to FLS is it's just fun. Like, like they, everyone on the stage is having fun and then they share that energy and mm -hmm. like joy with the audience. So you feel like you're kind of in on these like inside jokes that like you don't maybe hear, but you see like you and someone else, like you and UTK like share a look and then you like, you feel like you were there for the inception of that. Absolutely. And that's the, that's always the magic of, of Freestyle of Supreme. It's like, you're the only people that are seeing that show and none of us have any sort of, there's no, what is it? There's no fourth wall. Like, it's just like, everybody's, everybody's in on the joke and everybody's in on the thing. And in essence, like everybody's there creating it with us. So I think that there's like a little bit of that. And also I think my favorite reactions are when I get as floored by the crowd 
And so like, and there are times there have been show stopping events in freestyle love Supreme where you just like can't stop laughing and I can't play and I can't do anything. So I just stop and I laugh my face off and then I like kind of get back to it and whatever, yeah. you know, but like there's some moments where you're just like, holy shit, like you can't believe that this just happened. And, and, and that's the magic of it. And those, you know, it's interesting is that those moments happen more and more often these days with that show mm -hmm. because everybody's just kind of at the top of their game and you kind of can't believe what we're doing. So yeah, that's, yeah. I, I, I take here's another talk about like taking things for granted. Like freestyle of Supreme has always just kind of been what it is, which is like just guys making up raps. Like it didn't seem it didn't seem like we were doing anything that was that uh, earth shattering or that like worthy of a Hulu documentary. It was just like a bunch of guys hanging out, being dumb and like making each other laugh. And and then <laughs> here we are. You know, it's just like it's it's you, know, you can't you can't quantify or qualify any of that stuff. It just happened, and uh, it's uh. I, it's it's a, some of it just, so much of it is why I can't find the words is very unexplainable. Like it just sort of, it, it's, I don't know. It's just you know there we were making up raps and now people come to see it and now we're on Broadway. Like it was just all it, it like made no sense, but then it also made all the sense. Like it was just like of course it is. Like Lynn is this famous guy and this is this other thing and we do this thing. Like let's run out of theater and do this thing and it's so fun. Like whatever you know. So I don't know. Very unexplainable yet explainable at the same time. All kinds of contradictions I am today. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. It's a perfect way of explaining it. It is. It's so cool seeing the doc and like knowing that there was that foresight in some aspect to be filming it. And like y'all were babies. It was so mm -hmm. fun to see that old footage. Yeah. Shout out to Andrew Freed. I, I think we talk about him all the time as like the sixth member of or the whatever, the eighth member of Freestyle of Supreme. He has been my friend for like 20 something years. No, that's not true. 18 something years. Uh, he saw us do a show and he said that we're, we have something. This was before In the Heights and before Hamilton and before all the notoriety, before all the awards, way before the awards. And he was like, I just want to follow these guys around. And he followed us around. And then uh, uh, he uh, he he just became a friend and he like documented us. And we were just like, of course we have a guy following us around because we're cool. And, like it was like, we have no idea, we have no idea. And then like, he just became a friend. And so like, he would film us, but but I would be just like talking to him while he mm. was filming. And, and then, and then, you know, like he was at my wedding and like, da, 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 and, he, and you know, and the, 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 you know, the side jokes and the secret jokes are all, um, just on point with him but yeah you know, we just actually when the show when the movie premiered whatever last week uh i called him and it was just like talking to an old friend i was like you made a movie about us he's like i know it's bizarre i was like he's like it's absolutely bizarre like what are you doing and then, you know the whole thing and uh yeah and we were such kids like so i've gotten a number of uh emails about uh my hat wear and um <laughs> Because like, I think between the ages of 20 and 30, like no one was like, hey, you, you have hair. Like you don't have to wear hats all the time. And in my head, I was just like, oh, 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 no one told me that. And then in addition to that, um, my voice, so, so <laughs> in my early 20s, my voice clearly was much higher and your dog's there. And my, so my- Slim, it's okay, but you wanna say hi to Bill? Come on. Okay. <laughs> He's just like looking around like, why is no one paying attention to me? <laughs> yeah, I guess in my early 20s, I had a much higher pitched, nasal, more nasal voice because and there's one interview in that where I'm like, but like, and then my voice clearly got deeper over time. And and so that was like, I guess I went through puberty twice or something happened because it's just ridiculous. And, uh, and so anyway, those were all the, those were the emails I got, my high voice and uh, my hat wear. And uh, I don't know why no one told me that my hats weren't that cool. I also like, I have a gigantic head. So like maybe I was trying to hide it. I can't tell, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. To this day, I'm not sure. It is funny to look back at old photos and think like, why did I think that was cool? Yeah. Like I did though. Like I yeah. thought it was a great look and yeah. nobody was a good enough friend to be yeah. like, hey, hey friend. Yeah. Like. Like, and I was like sporting the hat look up until like two years ago. And then I was like, maybe I don't need to look like a homeless person like all the time. And like, maybe no. I should step it up a bit. And then I would like, I like grew my hair long. To, like the Hamilton, there's Hamilton footage of me with like really long hair. Yeah. And like, I look ridiculous and whatever. So you anyway. look like two different people when your hair is long. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> But I'm glad I've sort of, I feel like, uh, you know, I had kids and I should look like an adult at least sometimes. And so here we are, you know. The good luck now. Ah, thank you.
Yes, oh. yes, you're welcome. So are there, what are any stories that you might have from your FLS journey, which I'm sure are plenty, but something that maybe didn't make the doc that you wish people could have experienced? So the, the famous story that didn't make it to the doc is we were in Edinburgh. I think there's a scene where we're going to buy fries Mars bars, right? And so we were walking somewhere and we were standing somewhere and I got pooped on by a pigeon, like fully just like no. pooped on. And, and, and Andrew caught it on film. So there's like a whole bit of me getting pooped on by a pigeon and we're discussing like if it's lucky or if it's not. I was just like, this is disgusting. Like, why am I, you know, why is this a thing? But it got, you know, and so, so that's the, the major scene from that, uh, that, that got, and I, and I feel like the thing that would have been amazing if it was ever captured was that very first show that we talk about the white Russian, that whole bit about that mm -hmm. was, 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 I had gone to <laughs> the full story with that is I had gone to Coney Island with my whole family to go to this weird banquet hall to eat. And my dad and I drank too much and I was wearing a big suit. And I brought my saxophone to this thing because I wanted to be a part of the first gig. And I went and I, I don't even know that I could play at all. I think I sat in the corner. It was a, it was a disaster. But that was the first Freestyle of Spring like public show, you know. So, right. oh. uh, so yeah, uh, we're, we're grateful. glad that didn't make the film. But that was a good one. Uh, uh, I mean, there's so many moments. We've been everywhere. I mean, we went to, to we went to Australia. We went to Scotland. We went to uh, Montreal. We went to. Um, uh aspen we had been to all these festivals we were such kids and it was just like let's go to these places and make up raps so it was like it was like there's so many stories and so there was a in edinburgh there was like a, a room one of the rooms was underneath the stairs and and one of us had to, it was this tiny little and like we had to trade times that one of us had to be inside it and then like chris was the only one with a cell phone so his cell phone bill was like eight hundred dollars that month and he like home and like stuff like just stupid things like that but um but yeah we and then we met all kinds of cool comedians and you find that like you know stand-up comedians are the most ha hated sad people ever because we're like backstage with these guys and they're like you know in the early days we uh in montreal we opened for zach galifianakis who later became like zach galifianakis you know what? and and he would just like be backstage with us, just like drinking beers and maybe talking about comedy or whatever. And then at one point at the UCB, we opened for Aziz Ansari and like stuff like that. And it was just like, that's just what, and they weren't anybody back in those days, you know? And so, so yeah, there's a lot of stories like that. And um, uh, yeah, I could go on and on, but yes. That's so much fun. I, I actually went to the Fringe Festival last year, two years ago. It was it was so much fun. I was in the UK for my friend's wedding and we decided like, oh, if I'm gonna be here in the UK, I might as well like take a trip. And I went, you know, from London to Sheffield, which is where he got married. And then I went up to Liverpool and I was catching up with a camp friend and his sister and I started like hanging out and becoming close. And she's like, wouldn't it be funny if we like drove up to Edinburgh for like the day to see the fringe? I'm like, can we please? So yeah. we like, we drove up from Liverpool to Edinburgh just for like one night of like as many shows as we could see. And it was fabulous. And then like drove back and like downpouring cold rain. It was wow. just like such a fabulous random experience. And now I somewhat understand on like a deeper level what the craziness of the fringes and people like literally just handing out paper like hey do you have any show to see in an hour like come and join us yeah it's nuts it's like a whole ecosystem for lack of a better you know it's like the busking and the and the weirdos and the comedy and the not comedy and the yeah. the very fringy shows it was a really i mean i want to say that it was like you know new york's west village in the 60s you know or like whatever like where it's just like creativity and like da 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 da, da. and it, it felt like that a little bit and if you know that whole the whole process of like going outside and and like singing for your food or like you know singing for your shows was really fun because i think there's also a part of the movie where where tommy says something effective like we got there and we had no audience and no one knew who we were and what was interesting is that we were there for a whole month and for, for the first two weeks, it was just like, there was 10 people there. And like, we got out and then we started hanging out with the right people. And then like, da, 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 da. And then by the end it was like, you know, totally packed houses. It was really, and that's, you know, mm. previous to that, all of our shows in New York have been in these small theaters for like 50 people. So it was always packed. Cause like my mom was there, you know? So like, so that was, <laughs> it was a, it was a really weird, um, like eye-opening experience. Like 
I think some of us thought we were just going to go there and it was going to be packed and we're going to be the coolest thing ever. And it wasn't. And we had to earn it. And that was fun. And then, you know, and that that happened everywhere we went. So like Australia was like that and Montreal was like that. And that's sort of the fun of it was just like you had to earn the audience. It wasn't like you could roll in and just, you know, be the guys, which was cool. Right. Yeah, I love that that dichotomy of like growing up and doing that and then like being on Broadway and you have like all of these people and then like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think you, there were so many like crazy celebrity guests that would just like show up like Josh Groban was there one yeah. day and that was bonkers. Yeah, at, at FLS. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you know, from all of our sort of friends that we've met over the years all of them kind of wanted to be part of it in any way they could and josh uh, uh, i wasn't there that night but josh uh, has been on sesame street and josh and i little known fact josh and i are third cousins and i know know this because he and i were working on a show together and my mom said uh, uh you know we're third cousins and i was like i don't think we're third cousins mom and she sent me a family tree on which me and josh were like near each other over on this side of the thing and he was sitting right next to me I was like, I was like, Josh, I don't know if this is creepy, but I think we're related. And he was like, holy cow. And so we have this whole joke about cousins and da da da. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, Josh, and then, you know, uh, there was a time where from the Roots was going to play with the. Uh, I'm going to close the door because Slip okay. has gone from like, I'm going to bark a little to like, let me take over. Sure. I love you, bud. So sorry. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's i still left it like slightly oh sir paul mccartney came oh my goodness yes i heard about that i wasn't there that night either so what happened was uh while most of uh uh freestyle love Spring was happening on broadway i was in london working on and juliet and so i only came back whenever i could come back it was a long process i was in london from like july through november of last year. And so, uh, um, cause we essentially did like an out of town run in Manchester and then an in town run in the West End. And so I just moved and was there. So anyway, when I could come home, I came home and did freestyle of scream shows, but I was super jealous because like Paul McCartney showed up and like, oh, and then like Helen Mirren and, and uh, uh, um, Ian McClung, right. They showed up one night and just like crazy craziness. And so I was a little yeah. jealous about that. It is what it is. It's casual. It, yeah. it was crazy though. Like even just as a fan, it got to this ridiculous point where like I'd already seen it. I saw it like five times, I think in the first like week, week and a half, just because like a new friend would be like, hey, do you want to go see it? Or like, oh, I have an extra ticket or I have a rush ticket or mm -hmm. here's a press ticket or, you know, like for whatever reason. And I'm like, yeah, I guess so. Like what else am I going to do? So already by like the second week of previews, I'm like, I don't think I should be at this Broadway show like as much as the actual like performers are. Yeah, like anymore, right? I know, totally. I, I, I felt super guilty about not being there. It was a real bummer, but uh, it was just sort of how, how it all panned out. Um, yeah. But I like the fact that like that, uh, I thought one of the most interesting things that we were able to accomplish was that was uh, we had, uh, we could put on a show every night, whether it was like bringing in other people or special guests or, we found another beatboxer that could do that show, which I thought was like, that yeah, was never Kayla. gonna happen. Yeah, and that like shock, you know, Shockwave did like a million shows and so did Utkarsh and they were just there and they like owned it. I just thought that was so cool, the fact that we could really pull that off. So that was neat. A hundred percent. And then like you said, to have Kayla and then Anissa come in and you had like, you grew the family. By the way, shout out to Anissa. I, there was just an article in Forbes magazine yeah. about Anissa. I don't know if you saw that, but that shit's crazy. She's so unbelievably talented. And we treat her like a little sister. I do. And I think she's incredible. She just did a thing for me for Sesame Street. And she couldn't be like more talented if she wanted to be. And she's one of my favorite people. And shout out to her. She's amazing. I amazing. love Anissa so much. Yeah, she came on the series last week. Nice. What is time? Time is, yeah. you know. Yeah. Last whatever. <laughs> Not today. Yeah. And oh. it's cool because I did the FLS Academy. And of course, we all know her story from mm -hmm. being uber talented and doing it and then going on stage. We actually did a commercial together once, which was a very really? funny thing. Yeah. That's like wild. a year ago before I like really knew who she was. And then I think we like sat next to each other on the train. It's one of those funny things. 
kind of like what you were saying with the Frank that like you knew these people and and then they like became people other people knew as well and you're like mm -hmm. oh right wait that's, I know this yeah. person yeah that's always the weirdest to this day like so my kids call Lin, Lin Uncle Lin like Lin you know Lin's been a family member my whole life and so like watching him be this famous person is all very funny for all of us and right. that's you know pretty much with everybody but that yeah yeah, I, yeah. I mean, Anissa particularly, she just like came out of nowhere and she's the funniest person I've ever met. And she's just like so, you know, she's very outspoken on stage and very kind of soft spoken behind the scenes. And she's just she's just unbelievable. And, you know, the funny thing is, is I had never been to a rehearsal or done anything with Anissa until I think I was on the stage with her. And we were just like, this is what we're doing. And so I was like, cool. Who are you? Like, I met her like like right before the show started. And then it was just like you're the, you're the person I'm going to do this, help me, you know, like, you know, so, I mean, the thing with me for Frizzell is I've been doing it for so long that it's sort of like, um, you know, riding a bike as it were, but, uh, but, you know, to, to have like new blood in it and have different people. And that's, it's, was, it was really exciting. And like also kept me on my toes. Like it's, it's easy for me to like, to like do that show. But like when Kayla's there, her, like her groove is different. And when Anise is there, yeah. like her thing is different. So that's always really fun and challenging. Do you remember the advice you gave to Ian Weinberger, his first performance? Yes, I do. Cause he wrote it on a piece of paper and he, what was it? <sighs> something, something don't fuck up. Right. It was like something like, and don't fuck up. That sounds like, it was like, it was like, this isn't fucking brain surgery. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's so funny. So we brought in, so when, uh, when, when Arthur and I couldn't make it, we bring in Ian Weinberger and Kurt Crowley, who are, you know, are the genius music director dudes of Hamilton. I've known Kurt, you know, Kurt was the first uh, music director of the second national tour of In the Heights, like a hundred years ago. And nice. I, flew, I flew out to Gainesville, Florida or something like that. And I met Kurt, or no, it was something, and whatever. I flew out to somewhere in the middle of nowhere, and I met Kurt, and I, you know, coached him through the In the Heights stuff, and he's the nicest guy ever. Kurt, I don't know if you know, is like a Harvard graduate with like a degree in religion and music, and is like so cool. And he's from Helena, Montana, and he's just like the nicest, greatest, most talented guy ever. And uh, uh, he came into to freestyle and just sort of like made it happen. And the, the funny thing about him and Ian, Ian similarly went to Northwestern and like is an unbelievable musical talent and is also mm -hmm. the nicest guy in the world. But uh, I had a big hangout with Ian's parents at the Freestyle of Supreme opening night party. Like they kept on hanging out with me. Uh, but uh, but um, so, uh, oh, so they both, you know, they're both used to like reading music and like very, um, you know, technical about the playing of the thing and the doing of yeah. the thing. And so what I told both of them was like, don't think, don't do anything, don't, mm. this is not like a, you just have to play notes and like groove. Like if you think too much, you're gonna like fuck up badly. And the same thing I had to do with Alex Lackamore, who often sits in with us, the thing, he'd be like, what do I do? What do I play? I don't know what I'm doing, blah, 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 blah. And he has done whole shows with us where I just like yell cues at him and do stuff with him because he can just play stuff on his feet. You know, he's like amazing like that. And so, yeah. so that's been kind of fun to like watch Broadway dudes, who I call Broadway dudes, but are, you know, Kurt and Ian just like sort of morph into these freestyle of Supreme guys and they've done an amazing job. And they're, you know, now they're part of the fabric of that whole ridiculous group of people. That's amazing. Yeah. And that, that opening night uh, party was so much fun. Like <laughs> for me, it's so crazy to be at a party with Questlove DJing, but like mm -hmm. you work with him. I do. Yeah. Quest. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, it's still sort of funny. I was when I was in college in like 1999. Uh, um, I was like a my my freshman year roommate Matt Durning was from Williamstown, Massachusetts, and was just like a huge music guy. So cool, had the best music collection, and he got me into the roots, like early roots, like Organics and Do You Want More and all that other stuff. And so I was just like, holy cow! And then they played my senior like a uh, spring fling thing at Wesleyan was the roots, which is hilarious, which I still talk to him about that. So anyway, so then we were working on uh, the Hamilton record and uh, we were in this studio uh, somewhere and it came out that I worked for Sesame Street. And so then Questlove was like, oh my God, I'm the biggest Sesame Street fan ever. So we immediately became best friends. And so like we would talk about Sesame Street and music and we would, and then while we were making the Hamilton record, and then this is the fun part is after the Hamilton record was done, he called me one night and he was like, hey, uh, I'm doing a podcast. You're the first guest. 
And I was like, what? I was like, okay, okay. So uh, uh, he's like, come to 30 Rock. We'll do it whenever after we film Fallon. And I'm like, okay, whatever. So I show up to Fallon. So we're in the little room where the Roots rehearse. And uh, it's me and Questlove and this other guy, his name's Fonte. He's from this rap group called Little Brother and another woman and da da da. So I'm expecting this to go for like 30 minutes. We talk about Hamilton, we talk about Sesame Street and I go on my merry way, end of story. So what happened was for an hour, we talked about um, Sesame Street. And then for three hours, we talked about the most random musical smorgasbord of ridiculous knowledge and stuff. And I was just like, what in the world am I doing here? And then this is the best part is like a week later, he calls me and he goes, hey, uh, y uh, you're on the podcast full time, just show up. And I was like, what? So like from that point on, we're like doing interviews with like Chris Rock, Dave Chappelle, A Tribe Called Quest, Michelle Obama, blah, 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 like all these p famous people. And I'm just like, I have no business. Like you, you're, you're, we were at a studio once talking to Dave Chappelle and D'Angelo walks in and sits down next to me and introduces himself to me. And I was like, oh, hi, D'Angelo. And then like Lenny Kravitz and like all of these people that were on the stage at the Roots picnic and the thing talking to Common and we just become really good friends. And he still writes songs for Sesame Street. And uh, uh, we did a thing for Solange and stuff like that. And, uh, and it's been just the wildest, one of the wildest things I have. And we like talk to each other like friends and stuff. And every time I see him, it's great. And the joke that we have, actually you'll find this funny is because I wear hats so often and my hair is always so ridiculous. There was a time for about two years where every time I saw him, if I had a different haircut, he wouldn't recognize me. And so I kept on like going up to him at parties and stuff because we would be at the same parties. And he'd be like, I'd be like, it's Bill. And he'd be like, oh man. And this happened like honestly, like three or four times. And then finally it was just like, God, stop, stop not recognizing me. It was pretty funny. <laughs> this is me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's amazing. I, I honestly love those little type of stories and like moments because it's so easy to think of someone like Lynn or Chris Jackson, Davi Diggs, Questlove as like these people who are like award winners and on the stage and screen and whatnot. But to hear these like human moments of yeah. like, oh, this is our little inside joke. That's the best. Yeah. I mean, Chris particularly. So Chris and I have been best friends since like the early days of In the Heights. And uh, he, you know, he was at the birth of my kids and I was at the birth of his kids and just like stupid little things like that. And we've been very good friends for a long time. We used to like just sit around and write songs together and stuff like that when that was still a thing we could do. But we don't do that anymore because he's very popular and he's important and, you know, I have stuff to do. And it's just it's, it's strange. You know, we don't. Yeah. It's but when you work with your friends and stuff like this happens, these sort of the, the rules change and it gets different, but it's, you know, it's great. Just a different. Yeah, that makes sense. It's so funny. Like I've, I'm in a bunch of Hamilton groups on Facebook and people keep posting like David on Sesame Street and Chris and Lynn and like all of these moments that I'm like, oh, this is very convenient because I'm chatting with Bill. Like, is it is it funny to write like this rubber ducky song for Davi Diggs? And it's like, it starts off like as this like rubber ducky and then it's like a, a rap. Yeah, absolutely. It's bizarre in every possible way. So like the fact that uh, I can pull things like that and have my friends be on that show, it's, it's great. It's like very surreal and bizarre. And so, and the best part about it is like when you get to collaborate with them. So I called Davi, I think, or like, I called Davi and I was like, what do you want to do for this? He's like, why doesn't it do this? And so I was like, cool. And so he did it. And then like Lynn was like, I don't remember what Lynn, oh, uh, the first time Lynn was on Sesame Street was a, the first song that I wrote on Sesame Street. Like wow. it's a it's a habitat. And so we we put that together together. And then like Chris, Chris and I have been writing songs forever on Sesame Street. And so he, when he, you know, when he comes on it and does stuff, we just sort of put it together. And, you know, that's just kind of how it is. I don't, I know that sounds ridiculous, but that is just how it is. <laughs> Amazing. So I, I want to definitely make sure to talk about Anne Juliet. But the first Perfect. part, I guess maybe we do it together, is a lot of people were asking, like, what's the difference between like what an orchestrator does and a music director and a music supervisor and a producer for like the Hamilton album? Like, what are those different type of job titles that you do? Uh, sure. So what I've learned over the years is that those job titles are completely different depending on what genre of media you're in. For example, mm. in films, a music supervisor is more like this overlord who just like takes care of certain things and like contracts and stuff like that. And then if they need place like placement music, they're kind of responsible for that. But 
it's not you know music supervisor in a Broadway show is like someone who you know makes sure that all of the music works and conducts and like does another thing, and then sometimes the music supervisor in a theater show is an orchestrator and arranger, which is like. Well, let's put it like this. What happens is the composer writes the song and sometimes the composer will like uh, write like a fully realized thing with a band and a blah, blah, blah. And sometimes they'll just write like a melody and they'll sing it with the piano. Either way, the orchestra, the arranger's job is to sort of take that, those pieces and put it, make it into a cohesive song. And then once that's done, uh, uh, the orchestrator takes that song and like writes all the parts for the different instruments. That's what an orchestrator does. And so, uh, orchestrating and arranging is pretty similar from same thing to thing. And then like in movies, there's film scoring where it's like all the music you hear in the background, right? And then uh, uh, in TV, that's similar. There's like a guy who writes the score. And then, um, uh, yeah, and that's, and so music director, so it's like music supervisor, music director, assistant music director, band. So the music director sort of leads the band and music supervisor sort of oversees the music directors. That's pretty much the, if that makes any sense whatsoever. That's sort of how it works. It's, it's a little confusing because what I've learned, like I said, it's, it's so different in movies than it is in television. And then it's even different, more different in theater. So it's all like sort of, you know, you, you figure out the role as you go for sure. Yeah. Um, uh, and I weirdly, I was talking to someone about this the other day, I've kind of been all of them. So, mm -hmm. uh, you have to sort of, you know, uh, stay in your lane, as it were, when you get to different different genres, because you don't want to be overstepping the music supervisor's thing when you're the music director and blah 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 blah. So, right. uh, so yeah, there's a lot of um, what sort of bureaucracy when it comes to this stuff, but um, uh, they're all just trying to make good music at the end of the day. So, yeah, that does make sense. I think there were so many different aspects. Like I was joking with you earlier that I printed out your, your whole resume, which I haven't even looked at because this conversation has just flowed so naturally. Oh my God. But imagine that. But it's like, it's true when you, you've done so many different things on different types of shows and movies and upcoming projects. So it's, it's fun to kind of hear those differences, which leads me into asking like, how did you get involved with Anne Juliet? Oh, uh, well, uh, uh, oh, right. Okay. My agent called me and said, Hey, do you know who Max Martin is? And I said, I've been writing songs for the past 20 years. I know who Max Martin is. And he's like, uh, would you be interested in like some sort of jukebox musical of Max Martin songs working with him? I was like, absolutely. So he says, okay, they want to audition like music supervisors. So they're flying you to Los Angeles to meet with Max and the other producers. And I was like, okay. And then they're like, by the way, the book writer is this guy named David West Reed, who wrote this one play on Broadway that sadly closed because of a terrible storm. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he's also the writer of the show. I don't know if you've heard it. It's called Shit's Creek. This is before Shit's Creek was like a major like deal. This is like in the early days. Mm -hmm. And so, and so I was like, okay, let's do it. So uh, I fly to Los Angeles. I stay in West Hollywood at a hotel that is one block from where Max, so Max Martin has a, a house in the Hollywood Hills and then a house in West Hollywood that just has studios in it, like just music studios in every room. So the, and it used to be owned by Frank Sinatra. So that's cool. Uh, so I walk to this place. I'm terrified out of my head. I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, I walk in there, uh, I sit down and I talk to Max Martin and our producers, Tim and Teresa and Max Martin's dog and his wife uh, about musicals and about how to make their show into a musical. And they, and by the end, I've somehow managed to convince them that I like know a lot about musicals. So let's just be clear. Like I've worked on In the Heights and I uh, worked on the Hamilton record but this is actually before that. So anyway, I don't know anything about musicals, but they're convinced that I know about musicals. So I get home and two days later, my agent calls me and goes, hey, you got the job on the Max Martin musical. And I was like, okay. So what that meant is over the next two to three years, I would fly to LA or wherever and meet with David West Reed, the book writer, and sort of figure out how to string this whole thing together. Yeah. And then we would have readings. And then finally they hired a director, this British guy named Luke Shepard, who, if you don't know, directed this incredible production of In the Heights in London, for which he won an Olivier. And then uh, he became the director of Anne Juliet. And then we started sort of staffing up and we'd do readings here in New York. And then we would do, we would go to London and do readings in London because the goal was in the same way that sort of um, 
uh, Mamma Mia had started in London and then went to Toronto and da -da -da. that's what they wanted to do. Like they didn't want to go straight to Broadway. Like that was the key. Right. So I was like, all right, cool, London. Like I've never spent a lot of time in London, let's do it. So then um, we hatched this plan to do this out of town Manchester thing and then go into the West End. And it just took a long time. I hired this guy named Dominic Falacaro, who is a, you know, a pop producer and not necessarily a theater guy. And uh, he came in and, and wowed us all. And I'd hang out with Max Martin and we'd talk about, you know, Katy, Katy Perry would walk in while we were talking and she'd be like, hi, and be like, hi. you know, like crazy, just like that. And then, and then just like total bizarre. And then, uh, and then we would, you know, we made this musical together and it was like, I will say that it was like making a, a record in a theater as in we would, we would sit and listen to the band and everybody sing and, uh, and sort of mix it like you were mixing a record as opposed to, which is like sonically, I, you saw Juliet, but it sounds better than anything I've ever worked on in my life. Like it just sounds the clarity of all of it. And the sound designer is this English guy named Gareth Owen, who was just amazing and he figured out how to make it like rock and sound really full and amazing, but while still you could hear every single word, which I thought was like this unbelievable achievement in a house in the West End, the Shaftesbury, which is enormous. And so, yeah. It was a really fun, really amazing project to work on. And then sadly, like as it was starting to gain, you know, steam, we got all shut down, as you know. Yeah. So like hopefully, which I think will happen, you know, Julia can come back with a, a vengeance because it's the most, I will say, it's almost impossible to go to that show and not come out smiling or something because it's so fun and so ridiculous. And I'm not saying that because I work on it. I'm saying that because it just is that good. Like it's not trying to, not trying to put your emotions upon you are not trying to make you feel anything you don't want to feel. It's just fun and exciting and like the coolest, one of the coolest things you'll ever see. And I loved working with it. It was great. I love to hear how much joy it brings you because it certainly brought that for me. I see a lot of friends here who I've like obsessively spoken about it with because Anne Juliet was that type of show that so back when I saw you in late December, I'm thinking um, we, my boyfriend and I were about to go to London mm -hmm. and you were like, oh yeah, you should see Anne Juliet, the show I was, I'm working on. And we're like, oh yeah, I heard about it. Cool, cool. So that was kind of like on the game plan. We knew that we wanted to go see it. And I'm that type of person that when someone asks like, what's your favorite type of music? I'll be like, Broadway in the 90s. Like, that's my... So, so it's for you. Yeah, it feels like it was written for me. It yeah. was musicalizing my favorite music. Yeah. And it was so good. I, I was listening to it before. I listened to it all the time. John, my boyfriend, and I quote it to each other nonstop. Like the... It's great. You, that you shows think great. I'm into drama? A five, yeah. six, seven, eight. Yeah. It's great. That show's great. I, I I didn't know how great it was. I think, you know, this is another thing I say in the freestyle documentary, which is like, I don't understand how good things are until they're like right happening. That show yeah. felt the same way. Like we were working on it and we were like, is this gonna, is it too ridiculous? Like, is there too much confetti? Like, what are we doing? Oh shit, you know? And then like yeah. people loved it and people were like dancing in the aisles yeah. and people were singing out loud and, and like grandmas loved the like Shakespearean aspect of it. And then like people who are in our age range or somewhere near that, just like yeah. when you hear, you know, everybody or, um, um, yeah. you know, it's gonna be me or any of that stuff. You're just like, holy crap. It, those songs bring back so many like fond, crazy time memories. And, yeah. uh, uh, you know, and, and getting to work on that music was just so bizarre. We like actually like went back into the original recordings and was like, we were like mining all of the, wow. The stuff that he did in you know in the '90s, and it's just like so unbelievable and great. And he's the funniest thing about this whole process is that Mac nobody knows about Max Martin because he doesn't right. do interviews. He doesn't do, like he would never do this. But the thing about Max Martin that's so funny is like if you actually sit him down and talk to him, he will never stop talking. And so so I feel like somebody needs to like get him on a show because he won't shut up, and it's awesome because he's so smart and so humble and so nice and so like smart i thought you said that he's like he's unbelievably intelligent about song structure and the way that they do things it's so fascinating and he's just uh, you know is an unbelievable person to work with and for and like one of my favorite experiences of today was working on that show for sure wow and it's not your average jukebox musical in like two ways one because it doesn't like tell the story of the artists themselves so it's not that type of jukebox plus like it perfectly finds the right song 
for the right moment. And like, you'll hear the first few notes as the scene's starting and you're like, ooh, I see what you're ha we're doing here. Yeah, or like, yeah. You know, they, they create this fabulous character, May, and then like, I, I don't, I'm trying to like hold back what I like say or don't say, but also a lot of these moments are on the album. So like, if mm -hmm. you listen to it, it's not a surprise, but I guess a, another question is how many were those characters named because of references to like a note or a lyric in the song? hundred percent. The song, the, the show was written around the songs. And I like, to, I think the most kudos should be to, uh, to David West Reed. He figured out a way to make all of those jokes and those lyrics land. And the funny thing about pop lyrics, aside from theater lyrics, you know, like, so theater lyrics, every word, if, if it's a good theater piece, you know, like for the narrative and a lot of pop lyrics are really repetitive. So like, for, like, um, oops, I did it again, for example, it's just like the same thing twice. And so like, if you're trying to tell a story with the same verse and chorus twice, it's like, you can't do that. And so we were, we kept on, you know, truncating things and moving things around until it worked and then putting things on top of each other and just like, but trying to do our best version of telling a story with like these lyrics. And what's funny is because like some of the lyrics are not grammatically correct at all. And so like we would constantly mess with Max. So Max is Swedish. And so he has this very funny uh, relationship with English. And so like okay. there's some things he'll just be like, I can't believe I wrote that. And just like stuff like that, you know, um, there's one in, a t in Break Free, uh, now that I've become who I really are, when it should be now that I've become who I really am or something like that, you know? And it's just like yeah. totally raw English. And like, but he got he gets away with it. It's just, it's totally fine. You know, Ariana Grande sings that out loud in concert. And you're just like, what the, you know? And uh, yeah. so, yeah, so yeah, uh, uh, it, it was David, David was the, the, the secret, you know, puppeteer behind all that stuff, just making all of the jokes land and all of the, yeah. the story. And the interesting thing about Angelia to me is that like, it, it is emotional and you do care about the characters yeah. and uh, and uh, and it's a jukebox musical that isn't, you're right. It's not like, it's not the story of Max Martin. It's like legit story of, or retake of, of Romeo and Juliet, but it, it actually pulls on emotional things and works on, on so many levels that no jukebox musicals do, which I thought was really cool. Yeah, it's so, it, it gets you in with the music that you know and love. And like this story, like, oh, I wonder what it is, would be like if it were from like Juliet's perspective and also mm -hmm. like that Shakespeare and Anne Hathaway combo. It's so, it's so much fun and so well written and the music's amazing. Like I could go on and on, I won't, but I, if anyone here is watching this and needs someone to gush over Anne Juliet with, like just message me because <laughs> I Me too. love it. Right. So much fun. And a fun fact that kind of circles this whole conversation together. So when we went to see Anne Juliet, we saw the day before. So we went on a Thursday and I was mm -hmm. like, I'm obsessed with this. We're coming back tomorrow. Like if you want to see something else cool, like I, I need to experience this one more time while I'm in London. And Lynn tweeted out a photo from Hamilton, London, that he was there. And we're like, wouldn't it be funny if Lynn were here? Like, I mean, he's friends with Bill, so it would make sense. And we were joking that whole day, like, yeah, there, it would be so funny. Ha 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 ha. I've seen Hamilton eight times. My boyfriend has seen Hamilton 48 times, wow. which is absurd, but he's never I think I've seen it that seen... That's amazing. <laughs> I know. And the joke is that like, he's never seen Lynn in person. Like he saw Hamilton a bunch. He saw FLS like 13 times on Broadway, never encountered Lynn in person. And of course, as you can anticipate with this story, we're sitting down, we're watching like the pre-show that Anne Juliet has on stage and in walks Lin-Manuel Miranda. And I just like hit John, I like do that eye like head nod where you don't want other people to like, I'm like it's Lynn, you know, you don't want to make a big deal. And the look on his face, like I had to go to London and see Angelia a second time to see Lynn. That's it was funny. amazing. He, uh, yeah, he was showing Mary Poppins, I think. And uh, he, yeah. And he would call me from the set of Mary Poppins in like his full on makeup and be like, what? am I doing here or whatever? And I was like, why don't you go see Angelia? So he went and he loved it. And he actually, you know, He's yeah. He 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 was very uh, floored by just 
the way it sounded and everything. So it was really cool. It was always nice to get his opinion on things too. It's always nice when like New York theater people, so that's the other thing is like, there's a totally different world between the West End and Broadway. And so like, um, getting like Tommy and, and Tommy Kale and Alex and all my friends had gone to see it because they were in town to see Hamilton as well. And uh, they loved it. And for them to like, you know, go from being like, you know, legit Broadway guys to loving that show was really cool. So I thought that was, that's pretty cool. I love that. Yeah, I hope, I really hope more people get to see it. Um, and it, it is cool when like you see other theater people enjoying something and he gave me the head nod though, like, I'm not going to say hi and bother you, but I like, I appreciate mm -hmm. seeing you. And that's sure. always like, it's cool. I know like y'all are friends, but as like a, a fan and reporter, it's cool to like know that when you see someone like randomly, like a uh, Lynn in the wild, that he was like cool and like gave me the head nod and smile. That's great. Just thought I would Good share that with you. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> so I, I know that the time is running out. I want to be very cognizant of your time here. I'm sorry that we like didn't get to more questions, y'all. I love all of these questions that y'all were asking and commenting. You're amazing. Um, I want to know if there are any final thoughts, like anything that you came in today wanting to make sure to share with all of your fans that maybe we didn't get to. Hold on, I'm reading all of these questions that I'm really, uh, uh, my kids are the same way as Bill's, but with telling everyone that their mommy is in law school. Nice, I like that. Uh, oh, can you tell a story about getting married on the, uh, yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, uh, when In the Heights was on Broadway, um, initially we were gonna get married in Hawaii, uh, and then that didn't work out. So we thought the next best thing was to get married in front of 500 people on the stage of the Richard Rogers. So uh, we got married on the stage of the Richard Rogers and uh, the band played and uh, everybody was there and it was a really wild, weird day. But um, yeah, I got married on Broadway stage. So there you go. Pretty fun. That's such a fun fact. I'm glad that person asked it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it says, I'm not gonna lie. I was really disappointed in the documentary for not giving Anissa's story. I agree, I agree. But the, the documentary was made before Anissa was in the group. And so like, that's, that's most of the reason I believe why um, for that. Uh, yeah, and Juliet is on my list and I'm so bummed I'm not going to London this year. You and me both, I would like to go back to London. I have a really good time there and that show is fantastic and go see it. But for, for those that are wondering, it will come this way soon. So we'll all get to see it here as well. So that's exciting. Victory, yes, that's very exciting. I can't, can't wait to just see it nonstop and have <laughs> other people to be able to enjoy it with. And there are so many like videos from like West End Live and the promos really well done. So y'all can still see like, you know, the, the legal, like a non bootleg. There's a lot yeah. of really good footage that like Anne Juliet's like social media and YouTube pages have for you. So I highly recommend checking that out. Check it out, it's worth it, it's great. That shows, and the record, get the record. The record sounds fantastic. Oh, oh there's course. another question. This is a funny story. What is Lack's FLS name? I, Lack doesn't have an FLS name. Lack is just Lackety Lack. He's always kind of been Lack. He's not, he doesn't have a name, but I think maybe someone should give him one. <laughs> but yes, that's it. And okay, wait, now that you say that, every, people were commenting about your like the bear claw hands or something. Yeah, so that story. So Lynn uh, once had, well, this is a long time ago. Lynn had a dream that I was like a bear. I was in a kiddie pool and I was like throwing salmon across his dream or something like that. And so like he told that to all of us. And so that became the thing. And so like Tommy will send me pictures of him in like Wyoming next to like giant bear sculptures and things like that. And so I know, I mean like I'm much bigger and taller than everybody else in that group. So that's where that comes from. That's fabulous. That, I'm glad, see, I'm glad I asked. That was so good. So where, oh, um, so are there any uh, nonprofits or charities? I always like to end the conversation. Um, if there's any, you'd like to give a shout out. Um, well, you know, I work for Sesame Workshop and they have this thing called the Yellow Feather Fund, which I think is pretty important. I think these days supporting actors equity is really important because all them actors are out of work. And I think that, you know, it's, this this vote for the, for you know, uh, money at the end of the month is coming up and hopefully that will work because unemployment's a thing. and. I would, I would give my money to the Actors Equity Act Fund for all our friends who work there. Yeah. Yes, yes, thank you for saying that. Very important, so many with that. And of course, I noticed that the show must go on, which is very 
similar to my thing, they're doing that with the West End musical. So you can get like mm -hmm. a cool shirt or mug and I have some Absolutely. Of that coming my way. So that's a fun thing to check out for sure. Or faux show as I like yeah, to there say. There you go. <laughs> and where can everyone find you on social media? My Instagram is bsherman2222. And I have a website. It's popmusicmisery.com. And I'm going to find all that stuff there for sure. Excellent. Y'all can find me at B-Way Show, B-W-A-Y-S-H-O, as you see from this beautiful banner across the Love screen. It. <laughs> and I want to give a shout out to all my show trions. That's the B-Way Show Patreon. Y'all are amazing. I see you in the comments. We do monthly video chats and we did like a Hamilton uh, watch party. So we do like that and trivia. So if that's something that sounds like fun to you and you want to support a local artist and reporter, you can go to patreon.com slash B-Way show. <laughs> and of course, oh, subscribe. Why not? Uh, thank you. Well done. And uh, subscribe to this channel because the show must go online and continues throughout quarantine. You can check previous episodes with like Jelly Donut and Ian Weinberger, Anissa Folds, Kayla Malady. Like there are so many. If you like, if you like this conversation, you can hear more of them and hear other like behind the scenes stories from FLS and all those other amazing musicals like Hamilton. All so much fun. So on that note, Phil, thank you so much for taking the time to chat. It was a blast. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. This is really, really fun. Uh, rock on. Have a good time. Good luck at being inside, everybody, and you know, stay safe. <laughs> Thank y'all for watching. See you at the show. Bye.